<laughs> so recently, the song that we just sung is perfect. It talks about faith from our fathers, meaning that we have faith through difficulties. We persist and remain faithful to the Lord until death. That is truly what a Christian life is about. It's just persistency. You know, those that are not Christian just kind of go through life sometimes. But those who really believe recognize that there is temptations and struggles and to try to stay on that narrow path. Jesus said the narrow path is hard. It will not be easy. But some people tend to say, oh, life is good. It's enjoyable. It's perfect. But we need to check our hearts and make sure we're saved. You know, over the years, yeah. You know, I ask that. I've been faithful to the Lord. Yes. I don't want to fall into sin. I need to stay faithful. And that's not easy because we face temptation, the world around us influences us, and we just are of the flesh, a sin nature, and we struggle. So I'm going to tell you the story that I read several years ago, and I was really touched by it. There's a boy and a girl. They had met each other and liked each other. They decided to date. And then they introduced themselves to each other's family. And they were all seemed to be a very strong Christian family. They would all go to church on Sunday together. And they were looking forward to getting married. The families were happy. But after they got married, The wife now discovered that her husband was into porn. It's a true story. And that's filthy videos, you know, filthy magazines. And the wife said, what are you doing? And he finally confessed that he struggled with porn growing up. His parents didn't even know. And so the wife says, hey, why don't you try to go get some counseling to help you manage or control that? You know, go to counseling, and when they were finished, or when he was finished counseling, he still was involved in porn. But the wife said, I thought you were going to try to stop. He says, well, I really don't want to let it go. You understand, as a Christian... That is something you should not be doing. Are you a Christian? And he kind of shrugged his shoulders. But the wife stayed with him. She loved him and he loved her. So they remained married. They think that maybe he wasn't a Christian. But, you know, that was really surprising, though. The families... You know, always together, going to church. They were excited for both of them, seeing that they were both strong Christians. But then to discover that he was not. So we should ask ourselves, you know, do I, am I really saved? And that's an important question to ask yourself and to check yourself. So I'm going to tell you a story about different people groups, you know, who thought that they were Christian. So I'm going to give you an example. And I'll show you some pictures. So the title of today's sermon is Almost Saved. Almost Saved. Meaning, are you really saved? Are you sure you're saved? But let's pray for Father, I pray, you know, before I 
came, I was a little nervous because this is a very serious discussion. It's a hard discussion. I don't want to cause people to doubt their salvation. But Father, I know that there are scriptures that reminds us to check ourselves. There are examples of people who seem to be strong Christians, but then changed. So help me sign clearly, and help me to stay true to your word. But to help us remain faithful, and in that we receive true blessing. Those who are remaining in sin miss those blessings. And some of those so-called Christians maybe will think, I'm saved, I'm a Christian. But when they die, they will go to hell. So Father, I pray that I sign your word and that it will touch those here and those watching the video to help remind us to check our heart to make sure that we are saved. So one example, there is a rich young ruler. He obeyed God's commands. And there's scripture, and we'll go through several of them. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. As Jesus was setting out on his trip or journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 18 said, And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is really good except God alone. So what did Jesus mean when he said that? Jesus himself was not God. He was not good. No, he was humble. But the point was, why are you calling me good teacher? Because Jesus knew that in this young ruler's heart that I was, he is good. He was good. He was thinking of himself as good. He asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus replied, you know the commandments. Do not murder do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud or deceive, and honor your father and your mother. And the rich young ruler said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. So it's true. The person who trusts in Jesus for salvation, they do have faith. But how do you prove that your faith is real? Is you notice it in people's works. After they've been saved, you notice what they are wanting to do for the Lord. They want to do things for their neighbor to show their love for God. And they do that out of thankfulness for their salvation. And that shows that their faith is true. But not all Christians declare, or they may declare that they have faith. I read the Bible, I go to church. But they may not all really be saved. So this rich man, he was a young rich man. He had nothing internally, though. 
He looked at himself outwardly. I am good. He did not fully recognize himself as a sinner. He said, yes, I followed all of God's commands from my youth. So let me show you the next scripture verse. Or the next scripture. James 2. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. That's what, what I was trying to make the point of. And I forgot to show you the scripture. But Jesus, looking at the young rich ruler, knew that he just wanted to see himself as good. He didn't have love for his neighbors, just love for himself. So Jesus replied, looking at him, loving him, and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Yes, I will follow you. I sell everything. I've already done that. Did he reply? Let me sh I'll talk about that later. But the rich young ruler actually was disheartened by the saying. He went away sorrowful, for he had many possessions. He didn't want to sell them. You know, Jesus met a person who was possessed by demons. And when Jesus removed those demons, he changed. What did that man do after being free? He wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to go with Jesus and the other disciples. He wanted to, and Jesus said, no, go tell what I've done for you, or what's been done for you. So he left to go and tell that. But this rich young ruler was so focused on his works. So Jesus warned, You should strive to enter through the narrow door. That's your goal, is to get through the narrow door. It does not mean having faith in Jesus is hard. No, that's not what this means. It's saying, trust in Jesus. Follow him. You know, you want to, but you're still trying to hold on to the things of the world. That door is narrow. You're still wanting to hold on to things, just like the rich young ruler. He didn't want to give up his good life, his possessions. He wasn't willing to let go. I read a book last year. Every road leads home. And it really shocked me. His name is Jewel Spock. He grew up here in Winston, Salem. In the 1940s, he joined the Air Force. And he was in World War II. He was a pilot. He crashed near Brazil. He found a way to survive and avoid the enemies and to be avoiding being captured with the help from people who lived in Brazil who were feeding him. And he successfully made it back to America safely. And when he got back, he felt this longing about his life going forward. So he went to the university. He graduated. And in this book, he said, I heard a voice. Giving me a sense.
sense that I needed to become a missionary. And he got married and headed off to Brazil to be a missionary. I was excited. I was reading through his book. And I was curious about his salvation experience. How did he understand the gospel and where his motivation came about preaching? And when I read through the book, oh, he was very working in Brazil with missions, helping people, people to find water and how to plant crops, you know, improve the lives of people in Brazil, economy, their health. He did a lot there in Brazil, and he stayed there for 25 years. In his message there, he said, I've seen a lot of young people give their lives to Jesus. And then when he came back to America, like the Presbyterian Church, at that time when he, they really respected him because he had been so involved in many different things for God. They wanted him to be on the board, help with different things in the community, and then he did. He did home missions, helping those who were homeless, Help with like nursing homes. It's a little bit north of Winston here now. He was involved in many different things. And people were very impressed. They wanted him to become a leader, a mediator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian. It's like a big Council for the Presbyterian Church. They wanted him to be a leader. And he died not far from here last year. And as I was reading, I was really feeling kind of grieved. There was no mention about his faith in Jesus. He never named Jesus as his Savior. There was absolutely no mention. I could not find any hints saying of his trust in Jesus as his Savior. That was shocking. And then it made me think, was he really saved? Secondly, another example. Who was with Jesus? He knew Jesus was involved with the disciples. Perfect example in the Bible is who? Maybe you can guess. Judas. Maybe you don't realize, but he was involved. He was one of the 12 disciples. He was with Jesus. He listened to Jesus' preaching and teachings. He agreed. He went to help. You know, feeding the 5,000. He prayed. I mean, just like we do, or just like the disciples did. And the disciples themselves had no idea that Judas would just betray Jesus. He would lead the Jewish guards to Jesus. The disciples were clueless. But during the Last Supper, when they were together, Judas already had a plan. And Jesus told Judas, go ahead and do it quickly. The disciples had no idea what Jesus may have been talking about. It said that no one at the table knew why Jesus had said this to him. 
Some of them thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, go buy what we need for the feast, the celebration. Or that he should go give something to the poor. The disciples trusted Judas with their money. He appeared to be a good person, somebody they could trust. But he deceived or betrayed Jesus. Judas himself was not really saved. He had no faith. Later, he killed himself. So there's people that seem to be strong Christians, involved in a lot of different things. You know, God's given them a ministry, and then you realize they're really not a Christian. Do we have examples? Yes, we do. In the 1940s, do you know this person? Billy Graham is here on the right in the picture, and Charles Templeton. Charles Templeton was a preacher. He, they, people said he preached better than Billy Graham did. But he preached the gospel. People would come. People were saved under <coughs> Charles Templeton's preachings. He established Youth for Christ. He was involved in a lot of ministries. But around 1947, Charles Templeton started having conversation with Billy Graham. I don't think the story of creation is really true. I don't think that really happened that way. And Billy Graham, it's biblical. That's the Bible. And then you go, no, come on. Billy, you know, the six day creation, that story's a farce. So then he came out to declare himself agnostic. Meaning that there was really no proof of a God, and maybe there was a God, but that's what agnostic means. And he wrote this book titled Farewell to God. He's died. He has since died. And then people heard him decide, declare that he was not a Christian, people were shocked. You preached the gospel, people understood the gospel, but you're not a Christian? What? So in the Bible, you know, there have been people there, like Alexander himself, who supported Paul. He changed and went against Paul. There's different things, there are different people in Scripture. And there have been many people who have left the faith. In about 2015, I was curious, because I had never heard anything about this young man, hadn't heard about him in a while. He'd written a book, a book. People thought very highly of him. And maybe you've heard of him named Joshua Harris. And I was checking because I hadn't heard his name in a while. And I was shocked. He declared he was not a Christian. He supports the LGBTQ community. The book is titled, And I Kissed Dating Goodbye. This is a very popular book, a bestseller. You know, 20 million books sold. He knows scripture. He's preached it and teached it. 
but wow. There's a pastor in Washington, D.C. who wanted him to take over the church for him. It was a big church. But now? I'll, let me back step and explain a little bit. He grew up as a strong, in a strong Christian home. He was home school. He never went to a classroom. When he became a pastor, he encouraged people to homeschool, not to send their kids to public school. But they had been problems. He resigned and moved to Canada. He went to seminary. He went to a liberal seminary. It wasn't like structural, I mean, foundationally biblical. He married, he divorced. He declared that he was wrong, that this book was wrong, that he had written. It had hurt people, especially those in the LGBTQ community. So he requested that his book be stopped and no more printing of it. And that shocked lots of people. They thought you were a Christian. So you imagine... All my videos where I were preaching, maybe on Facebook people have watched. Imagine next month or a few months later, I declare that I don't believe in God anymore. I believe in Jesus. You would be shocked. Right? I thought you were a strong Christian. You would be shocked, right? You know, I resigned as a pastor from Pinedale. And I took off. That's the same thing of what these people did to the people that knew them. It was very shocking. So what about you and I? I'm a Christian. I read the Bible. I go to church. I believe. But let's hold on to that. I need to give you this third example. You know the ten story of the ten virgins? Five were wise and five were foolish. One of those that were foolish, or the group of those that were foolish, y'all know the story. All of the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins all had the same responsibility to light their lamps when the bridegroom came to take them to the celebration for the wedding. That was their responsibility. This is a parable that Jesus told. And the five that were foolish is because they were not prepared. They did not have extra oil. So when the bridegroom finally arrived, their oil had gone. They had no ability to light their lantern. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. The wise virgin says, We can't share our oil with you. We need it. Go buy yourself some oil. So they left to go find some oil, and when they came back to join the wedding party, what happened? Afterwards, the other versions came also, saying, Lord, Lord, you know, they had already gone through the door of the wedding celebration. It says, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, honestly, I say to you, I do not know you. What do you mean you don't know us? Remember, we had our lamps for you. But our oil just, we ran out of oil. But his reply is, I don't know you. 
So in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, it says, Lord, Lord, I've cast out demons. I've preached in your name. I've done miracles in your name. But I don't know who you are. Depart from me. You remember that story or that parable? I was reading where a pastor was trying to explain to a woman she was wanting to become saved, and so he was explaining it to her. They sat down, he told her the gospel, gave her the scriptures. And she said, yeah, I'm ready, I want to be saved. So give me all of the names. She says, your list of names of the men that you've slept with as a prostitute. You know, that was her business. She was a prostitute. She was like, oh, oh no, uh -uh, I'm sorry. I want to keep that because I still need to earn money. I'm not going to give you the list. And the pastor said, you're really not prepared to be saved. Oh, yes, I do. No, you're not ready. You're not ready to repent and give your life to the Lord. It's the same as the five foolish virgins. They were not prepared. They didn't have enough oil. The fourth? I know I said three, but there's four, sorry. It says, this is talking to the people of Israel in the Old Testament. They enjoyed being in the presence of God. It would look like today, being a Christian, being in prayer, enjoying Bible study, you know, coming on Wednesday nights, coming on Sunday mornings, you know, just enjoying the discussion about God, the discussion about the gospel, the scriptures. And so it says, this is God speaking, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation, talking about Israel, wanting to follow, that did righteousness, and that they not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask me righteous judgments to help them, and they delight to draw near to God. It sounds like the nation of Israel were strong in their faith in God and in their communion with God that they knew deeply and trusted deeply in God. And so Israel came back to ask, why have we fasted and you see it not? Meaning, you know, we fasted. Have you not seen me for fasting? And I pray for protection, for food, for illnesses, for war. I fasted. Did you not see me fasting? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not acknowledged it? What's up with that? God knows, looking down, what was in their hearts. He says, Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. You know, just enjoying. Oh, yeah, I enjoy going to the temple, the fellowship, talking, discussing with other believers. But you oppress all your workers. Meaning that you have a good life, but you're using others, taking advantage of others. That's it, being hypocrisy. It's like, oh, I look it, but internally I am not. 
anymore. Something just came back to my mind. You know, before I was going to a church, a strong church. It's in Indianapolis. There was a gentleman there. He was the assistant pastor. He was very knowledgeable in biblical theology. We believed the same. He was a young man. Very active. Teaching. I just felt like we had this fit. You know? That we... I liked it. And then he disappeared. Where did he go? I asked. Oh, he's straight. He's left. He's turned his back on the church. Just disregarded God's word. So I was really shocked. Well, he was so spiritually motivated on fire. I could see it. I had no doubt that he was not a Christian. That really was surprising to me. So many will have a profession of faith. We profess. Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he's my Savior. Yes, praise the Lord. We all do that. All Christians should profess. Right? Whether you're a true believer or not, Christians should profess their faith. And then there's possession of faith. What's the difference? Profession or possession? Possession means there's nothing on the inside or there's something on the inside. Those who truly believe, have a profession of faith, have Jesus on the inside. But that is less than those who profess a faith in Jesus. That's the reason why the scripture says he does not know you. You know, there's different denominations, very liberal, supporting of many different things. There's not preaching truth. You know, talking about God's grace. No, they disregard it. Me and my wife and children went to a church. I thought it was a good church. And when I entered the church, it was so different. They were singing about a good, wonderful God. You're a good people, blessings, just to all feel good. And I'm like, but are we going to mention sin? about God's mercy, nothing. People were just smiling, blessing each other, thinking each other was good. There was no true gospel. You know, that it was just there to be yourself and receive blessings. There was no connection there. If I would sit there and say, I know that I'm a great sinner and that Jesus saved me, they may have been just thought, oh, well, wow, that's really strange. So the possession of faith, those who have true faith, it is very few. There are many people who profess that they have faith, but their lives will not show it. It will not be a possession of faith. But Jesus teaches us to check ourselves, and Paul wrote about it to the people of Corinth. He says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves? You know that Jesus Christ is in you? and check yourself. Unless, indeed, you fail to be or satisfy the test. So what does the scripture mean? 
You can talk it, but the walk is not there. They need to match. Meaning, I want to do things for the Lord. Out of thankfulness that you saved me a sinner. You know, like children. I want, they want to do things for their parents. You were good for me. What can I do for you? What can I do? It's just like God. God the Father doesn't need us. But out of love, we want to give him something. We want to help be involved in it. That shows love for the Lord. Do you satisfy that test? That thought. We'll discuss it. There's some scriptures. When you're when you fall into sin, get back on track. Come back. It's okay. Stay at attention. Yes, Lord, I'm sorry. I need to get back. I struggle. That is what a true Christian would do. That's the way they would talk. A so-called Christian won't talk about that or won't talk. No, I'm fine. I'm good. Temptation? No, not at all. No, no, I don't have any temptation. Those who are Christians know that there's temptation. They know that there's a right and a wrong. And that they must resist. It says, if my people are called by my name, and humble themselves, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. And then I will hear them from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and heal their land. How many times do people stray and come back? Many. It happens many times. But you must recognize that there is a sin, and that you need to get back. Those are the true believers. This verse here, there's many more verses. And it says, draw near to God, for he will be near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart. You're double-minded. And it says, for those who I love, Talking about his people, God's people, those that are true Christians, those who I love, I reprove and discipline them. So be jealous and repent. How many times do we fall and we need to get back to the Lord? It's a struggle to resist. But how many times do we do that? Many. That's a Christian word. We believe in the grace. We believe that he's forgiven our sins. Yes. And his righteousness is put on us. But we do struggle. Recently on Facebook, you know, this is a person letting me know that they were struggling. It says, now, you know, we all struggle with sin. Just, it's about remaining faithful. That's the Christian life. This is the last story or parable. And this is Jesus talking. He says, what do you think? A man had two sons. And the father went to the first and said, son, Go to work in the vineyard today. It's the grapes, you know, to make wine in the vineyard today. And the son answered, I will not. I will not. But then afterwards or later, he changed his mind and went. And then the father went to the other son and said the same. Go work in the vineyard today. 
and the other son said, I go, sir. But he did not go. So the question was, which of these two did the will of his father? And father, which one? It says the first. He rebelled. He didn't want to. But then he was sorry, and he went to work. That is a Christian. We will struggle. We know that we will fail. Thank you for the forgiveness, Lord. And we continue to try to stop. It's hard work. It's a progress. That is the Christian life. Not that, oh, I'm perfect. I study. I know the Bible. I love the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, wonderful, you know. Singing, being involved in Bible study, coming to church, just doing all the check marks. And, you know, saying, oh, no, I'm good. I don't struggle at all. Is not willing to open. Willing to admit. Still trying to hide the sin. Not willing to admit that sin is a struggle. It's about the works. Joshua Harris is an example. Charles Stapleton and Judas. Judas appeared to be a good man. He was supposed to have resisted. No, nope, he fell into it and went against Jesus. That's shocking. When we get to heaven, we will think that there are some wonderful Christians, and when we get to heaven, we'll wonder where they are. who might have struggled with sin, we know that, we can see that, they'll be there. Yeah. I trust Jesus. And you might be shocked. But the ones that you think should be there are not there. So there was a warning that came. And Jesus said to them, to the Pharisees, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go to the kingdom of God before you. The Pharisees, you know, they're just prideful. They were doing things on a profession of faith. Talking about what they did. Look at me, look at me, look at all I do. But they would not be in heaven. So let's pray. Father, we're so grateful, Lord, for your word. You just tell it to us straightforward. Help us to look to you, just like David. David struggled with sin. But he kept coming back. In Psalms, you can read it. He struggled, but he kept focused. And that's the Christian one. Thank you for your grace and your mercy on us. And we pray that we will wake up and stop doing and focusing on the works in the profession of faith, but to have possession of faith and to satisfy the tape, test of remaining faithful regardless of the storms, the struggles. In Jesus' name, amen.